thank you especially for coming on this uh, day of miserable weather here in New York. But this turnout, and I suspect we'll have some more people trickling in whose cabs got stuck in traffic, is a testament to how timely and important this issue is in the global energy landscape right now. Uh, my name is Jason Bordoff. I'm a professor here at Columbia School of International and Public Affairs, and I direct the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia. Uh, and on behalf of the Center on Global Energy Policy, Columbia University, and our partners at the Energy Forum, uh, the New York Energy Forum, really delighted to welcome all of you here today. The Center's mission is to improve the quality of energy dialogue and energy policy, uh, and to train the next generation of energy leaders. Uh, we do that through research and convenings on today's most pressing energy issues, particularly those that fall at the intersection of policy, of uh, finance and commodity markets, and global geopolitical trends and interconnections. And it doesn't take you long if you look around the global energy picture today uh, to see what the developments are with the greatest potential to transform the global energy outlook. It doesn't take you long before you get to the truly historic and transformative changes that are taking place in Mexico's energy sector. So we are really uh, delighted uh, and honored today to have with us uh, some of the people who are uh, at the highest levels of leadership in making those reforms happen within Mexico's energy sector. Uh, let me introduce them briefly. You'll hear from each of them, and then we'll have a panel discussion with them. Uh, so first, uh, let me make sure I have the order right. Uh, <clears throat> first, uh, Lourdes Melgar uh, will present. Uh, she was appointed as Mexico's Undersecretary of Hydrocarbons in 2014, served as Undersecretary of Electricity from December 2012 to February 2014. From 93 to 2007, held various positions in Mexico's foreign service, uh, and from 98 to 2002, was Assistant Secretary of International Affairs at the Secretariat of Energy. And in the academic realm, Dr. Melgar was the founding director of the Center for Sustainability and Business at the Monterey Institute of Technology, has been a visiting scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center, at the Jackson School, at the University of Texas, and has too many other uh, numerous uh, appointments and experience on things like the Trilateral Commission uh, and elsewhere to name, but uh, really distinguished resume and delighted uh, she is here with us today. Miguel Messmacher uh, was named Deputy Finance Minister for Revenue <clears throat> in December 2002. Before that, held several posts in the Finance Ministry, including as Chief Economist from 2007 to 2012, and in the areas of public credit and development banking, and in addition was an economic researcher <clears throat> at the Economic Research Department of the Bank of Mexico, and has worked at the International Monetary Fund as well. And then Juan Carlos Zepeda is the President Commissioner of the National Hydrocarbon Commission. Uh, within the hydrocarbon industry, Juan Carlos has also worked for the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Energy, and in May 2009 was appointed President Commissioner of the National Hydrocarbon Commission for a five-year period. And then earlier this year, uh, Congress appointed him <coughs> as President for a second five-year period. He has <coughs> economics degrees from ITAM. <coughs> Excuse me. University of Warwick and Georgetown. So after we hear the presentations from each of these three distinguished speakers, they'll come uh, up on stage here and join Ambassador Carlos Pascual for a conversation. Carlos, uh, as many of you know, is a fellow here at the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, before joining us a few months ago, he created and led the new Energy Bureau at the US State Department. Before that was uh, Ambassador to Mexico, Ambassador to the Ukraine, uh, Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Russia and Eurasia issues at the National Security Council, led the Foreign Policy Studies uh, uh, Bureau uh, office at the Brookings Institution, where we were colleagues, as well as in the administration, and now again at Columbia. Uh, so he has deep knowledge on all of the issues uh, that we are going to talk about today and is going to lead us in a discussion. And I want to thank also Ed Morse from City and his colleagues at City for helping uh, put this together. Ed is on the advisory board as well here at the Center on Global Energy Policy, has been a leader, a 
leading thinker and writer on global energy markets for years uh, in the private sector, in academia, in think tanks, has forgotten more about the oil markets than I could probably ever hope to know. And so really delighted Ed uh, and his colleagues are here with us today as well. So thank you all for coming, and please join me in uh, inviting uh, Minister Melgar to come, come up here to the podium. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure to be this afternoon here at Columbia University and to be able to address such a distinguished audience on Mexico's energy reform. Uh, before I get started, I would like to thank uh, J Jason Bordoff and uh, the Center on Global Energy Policy of Columbia University for, for the invitation. Um, let me get started. Uh, Okay, good. Well, as you all know, um, last December, Mexico approved an all comprehensive, truly historic constitutional reform. It is indeed a major reform because it touches not only upon the uh, hydrocarbon sector, but also into the electricity sector. And it is a very significant reform uh, for which we have already approved 21 laws uh, that were an, uh, is, uh, published in uh, August of this year. Let me go over the main uh, principles, the key principles that have uh, underpinned the entire reform. The first one, which is truly important to all Mexicans, is that hydrocarbons in the subsurface belong to the nation. That is uh, a key principle that uh, is uh, indeed embedded in our constitution and was uh, carefully written as well in the hydrocarbon law. Uh, this being said, we do, uh, uh, we do have uh, what is equivalent to booking of reserves for the oil, uh, oil and gas contracts. The second principle which underpins uh, this reform is that of free market access and direct and fair competition among, among state-owned enterprises and private companies. From my perspective, this is the principle that completely modifies the model that Mexico had been followed up to now, where we used to have two monopolies running the electricity and the oil and gas sector. Now in this new model, state, state productive enterprises, which is what CFE and Pemex will be becoming, uh, will be playing under the same rules of the game as any other of the participants. Of course, this new model entails that we need to have a new institutional arrangement. And in these new institutional arrangements, we need very strong regulators. And for this reason, both the National Hydrocarbons Commission, which is in charge of uh, regulating the exploration and, and production area of uh, hydrocarbons, as well as the Energy Regulatory Commission, which oversees the mid and downstream of the hydrocarbon sector, as well as the electricity sector, have been greatly strengthened. A key principle which is very keen to Mexican society is that of transparency and accountability. And, is, and as you will see shortly in the presentation, Throughout the energy reform, throughout every step, we have several components to ensure transparency and accountability. In addition, another principle that is uh, written throughout the reform and which was written up at the constitutional level is that of sustainability. Sustainability understood in its environmental, economic, as well as social components with a respect to, for human rights. And finally, the last but not least important principle for our reform is that of maximizing the state revenue with a long-term view of, uh, looking towards the development, long-term development of the nation. And the, in this regard, you will see that we created the Mexican Oil Fund for, uh, for Stabilization and Development, which is also a true game changer in our model. This is the new institutional arrangement. And in, in this institutional arrangement, the, the Secretariat of Energy, which is the equivalent to the Department of Energy of Mexico, uh, gets to really become 
the uh, agency that defines energy policy and also that coordinates all of the actors that participate in the energy sector. We have, as uh, new but very important players, other, uh, other secretaries, other ministries, such as the finance ministry, which will be in charge of defining the fiscal and economic terms of the contracts, of the EMP contracts, as well as the uh, Ministry of the Economy, which will be uh, helping us define local content for the, con for the contracts, as well as overseeing compliance. We have um, the, the regulators, as uh, I already mentioned, CNH, which is in charge of regulating the uh, exploration and production, uh, the upstream area, and the Energy Regulatory Commission, which is the mid and downstream, as well as the electricity sector. In addition to that, we have a newly created uh, agency, which is the National Agency for Industrial Safety and Environmental Protection of the Hydrocarbon Sector. In this regard, our regulators follow what is international best practice. That is, just as in the United States, you have MMS, which was divided into two entities. We have two entities in Mexico, one in charge of promoting exploration and production uh, in the upstream, and the other one making sure that we're doing this in a sound, uh, in a sound manner. Also, as part of the model, we created two new technical bodies to uh, regulate and um, uh, to regulate the electricity market and the nat natural gas market. One is the CENACE, which is the Centro Nacional de Control de Energía, which uh, used to be the dispatcher of, the, of, of electricity and belonged to CFE, CFE being the uh, national utility. CENACE came out of, uh, of CFE and now is not only in charge of the dispatch, but also will be running the electricity market and also will be in charge of defining the expansion of the transmission lines and granting feasibil the feasibility studies and the interconnection to all the participants in the electricity market. Uh, the Senagas will be in charge of, uh, first of all, will become the owner of the pipelines, the natural gas pipelines that Pemex used to have. We're talking about 9,000 kilometers of pipelines which are going to be passing to Senagas. And also Senagas will be administering the, um, the long-term contracts, the long-term natural gas contracts, as well as making uh, sure that there is uh, access uh, to, to the network. Um, in this model, in this new model, Pemex and CFE become um, state productive enterprises. And I would like to stress that this is not only a change in the name, it is actually a very profound transformation that these two monopolies will be undergoing as they face uh, competition. Uh, first of all, they, they get a new corporate organization, a new corporate governance in which each of them has a corporate board in which they have five new independent board members in addition to five members appointed by the government. Also, they have to be, the name says there are productive enterprises, they have to become uh, truly productive and they have to uh, act as if they were uh, companies listed in the stock exchange, even though they will not be listed in the stock exchange because we didn't go that far. Let me uh, take a minute to talk a little bit about the activities in upstream. Uh, EMP is still a strategic area uh, of the state. That means that uh, uh, the state gets to decide how to exploit its resources uh, through, in two ways. One is granting Pemex entitlements, and the other one is through contracts. Uh, regarding the entitlements, most of the entitlements that Pemex will be getting, it already got them in what we call round zero. Uh, round zero uh, was basically an act by which we reiterated the, the right of Pemex to work in certain areas, and we completed this process in um, August of 2000, of August of this year. Um, Pemex requested the areas it wanted to keep. It had to show that it had the technical, financial, and operational capacities to develop these fields in a competitive manner. And we awarded Pemex um, 
83% of Mexico's 2P reserves, and we awarded it 21% of Mexico prospective resources. And in this map, you can see that Pemex got a varied portfolio where you did get to keep areas in shallow waters, in deep waters, as well as inland shale resources, I mean shale oil, shale gas, and tight oil as well. We established in law that only under uh, exceptional circumstances will we be able to award Pemex additional entitlements. That means that from now on, if Pemex wants to grow its production base, it will, will have to compete as any other uh, company in the upcoming rounds. Nonetheless, let, let me stress that what we gave Pemex is enough for Pemex to be producing in the order of 2.5 million barrels a day over the next 20 years and a half. That ranks Pemex among the top five oil companies of those that are listed in, uh, in the, uh, uh, that, of those that report to the, uh, to the SEC. Now, in terms of exploration and extraction, the way we will be awarding the contracts, we have, first of all, let me stress, we have three different type of contracts. We have production sharing agreements, profit sharing agreements, and licenses. Concessions are banned in Mexico. The way we will be awarding these contracts is through a competitive international bidding process uh, where CNH will be the agency of the state that will be signing the contracts on behalf of the state, both with, um, with uh, the state productive companies, with private companies, or with the joint ventures that may come of, uh, of this participation of uh, state productive companies and private companies. Um, we established also in law a very specific cases in which we might, may have a mandatory participation of a state productive a company in a contract. And the cases are when there is a coexistence of fields or when we want to get some kind of technological transfer. Uh, also, we can use a special purpose vehicle for, uh, for participating in a, in, a, in a project when we think that it will be uh, quite interesting from an economic perspective. In any event, there is a top 30% ceiling of this type of participation and uh, this will be known prior to the bidding process. Also, uh, we establish a specific case for uh, the blocks that are near the border, and in this case, we establish that there could be a mandatory participation of Pemex of at least 20% in, in those areas where we think there might be a transboundary field. In case there is a transboundary field, then um, if, if it's confirmed that there is a transboundary field, then the treaties that we have signed with the United States will apply and we will do the, lim the limitation according to the treaty. Okay, I would like to go over the uh, contractual process. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's an international bidding process. Uh, the rules are quite clear in the law. And um, we established a mechanism of checks and balances in which each agency has very clearly defined responsibilities. This means that at no time a single person is making all the decisions. And also, this is, the whole process is quite transparent. Everybody can follow, follow very clearly what, what we're doing. So let me start with um, the selection of the areas. Uh, it is the, the Ministry of Energy that selects the areas that are, are put in the rounds. We do this with the technical support of the National Hydrocarbons Commission. Once we have selected the areas, we also are in charge of designing the contract. We define the modality of the contract, and for round one, we are being inclined towards production sharing agreements and licenses. And uh, we define every, all the content of the contract, basically the pre-qualification requirements, local content requirements, and all the specificities of the contract, with the exception of the economic and fiscal terms, which are determined by the Ministry of Finance. Once we have the, this contract, we also define the bidding process guidelines, and we give this whole package to CNH. At this point, CNH will be in charge of conducting the bidding round. It will be in charge of opening the data room, conducting the pre-qualification of the participants, conducting the bid, awarding, the, contra awarding um, the contract, and signing the contract. 
throughout the operation of the contract, which, as you know, in some cases could be more than 20 years, I mean, more than 30 years, uh, CNH will be in charge of um, approving the exploration and development plans, also authorizing the well drillings and managing the entire contract. There are other agencies that are, participate in this uh, process, in the operational process. We have um, the Ministry of Finance making sure that there is a adequate cost recovery for the contracts. We have the Ministry of Economy, which oversees the compliance with local content requirement. And we have the newly created agency for industrial safety and environmental protection, which has to make sure that we are, uh, that the companies are uh, following uh, the regulation and do all the, all the oversight. One of the key changes as well in our model is precisely the creation of the Mexican Petroleum Fund for Stabilization and Development, which uh, is a, a autonomous uh, entity which is within the Bank of Mexico, the central bank. Uh, it has a technical committee that is chaired by the Minister of Finance and in which the governor of the Bank of Mexico participates as well as the Minister of Energy and four independent board members. Um, this, this fund will be in charge of uh, paying the amounts due on the contracts and managing the state all revenues. Now, in most of our reform, we followed international best practice. We were not very creative. Being basically one of the last countries to open up its oil sector, Mexico was able to learn from the positive and negative experiences of other countries. In one case in which we departed from what is uh, international practice is in what we call the farmouts of Pemex. That is, when Pemex decides to migrate an entitlement one of those that we granted to it in round zero, to the new type of contracts. And in this case, we departed from, from international practice because Pemex will not be able to basically sit down and negotiate with uh, the party that it wants to partner with. What we establish uh, as a matter of transparency is to have a bidding process to determine who will be the partner of Pemex. Um, so we basically followed the same framework that I showed us a, a moment ago with a few changes. First of all, it is Pemex that has to request the migration. It's Pemex's decision to migrate an entitlement into the new type of contract. We cannot impose this migration upon them. Then, when we are doing the uh, definition of the prequalification requirements, the prequalification criteria, Pemex gets to give a, a binding opinion. So if Pemex does not agree with the criteria we are establishing, we have to change them until we get uh, the type of criteria, the type of partner that Pemex is looking for. But once we have that and we have the contract, we go through the same, the same scheme, it is only at the time when the prequalification is actually taking place uh, that Pemex gets to give a simple opinion to CNH. That is, they, they get to give an opinion if they're in agreement, but if they're not in agreement, CNH can continue with the, pro the process forward, um, regardless of, what Pe of Pemex's opinion. And once we have finished the prequalification, we go through exactly the same scheme, and it is indeed CNH that gets to sign the contract with Pemex and its new partner. Also, as part of the reform, uh, we uh, allowed for the migration of existing contracts, the CEPs and the COFs, which came out of the reform of 2008, uh, to be migrated into the new type of contracts. These contracts had been awarded through a, a bidding process, and for this reason, no bidding process is re re required again. However, uh, the process requires that an evaluation of existing contracts is done in the sense of uh, making sure that whatever revenue the, the state is going to get from the existing contract, that it gets at least the same or more from the new type of contract. Here again, it is a Pemex decision to migrate, and in this, in this scheme, a current contractor ends up becoming a, a partner of Pemex. So I already mentioned that we have 
different type of, of, of contracts. Uh, we have uh, license contracts and production sharing contracts as well as profit sharing contracts. And as you know, the license contracts and the production sharing contracts payment is in kind, whereas in the pro profit sharing contract, the payment is in cash. Uh, we are not here again, we are not departing for international best practice. We are basically, our contracts will look very much as the one that industry is used to. And as I mentioned for um, the first round, we are um, moving towards license contracts and production sharing contracts. Okay, let me go over some of the contractual provisions. First of all, the awarding variable uh, will be established in in each contract's terms and conditions. And it will be of an economic nature, considering government take and work program aiming at maximizing the state's revenue. So in every case, um, it will be of an economic nature, and we will always have, uh, of course, government take as the major, the major factor. In terms of local content, uh, it was established in, in law that there will be a local content requirement in each contract. We have to meet a, an average for all the contracts with the exception of those in deep water of 25%, uh, departing from 25% in 2015 and increasing to 35% in 2025. Um, also, we established in law that preference shall be given to Mexican companies that offer similar price, quality, and lead time conditions. Another important uh, component of our, our scheme and our contracts, I already mentioned, is that of sustainability. And in order to uh, select the areas that we have put in the round, we had to conduct, first of all, a social impact study. This is sort of a, an x-ray, getting to know what, it, what the area that we will be uh, awarding looks like. So we have to look at it in terms of, first of all, um, what kind of uh, population do we have? Do we have indigenous population? If we have indigenous population, that meets the requirement of the uh, 169 Convention of the World Labor Organization, then we have to conduct the consultation on indigenous pop population. We have to look at also at land tenure. Do we have small property? Do we have private property? Do we have a hido land or communal land? Because depending on that, the issues uh, have to be addressed in a different manner. And uh, once we have that, and we have, we look also at other issues such as whether they're all cultural or historic uh, sites, whether whether there there are uh, some uh, specific issues regarding environmental protection, or also issues regarding to infrastructure, then we select the area. And once this area is put in the uh, bidding round, whomever whomever gets the contract will have to conduct a social impact assessment that will be presented to the Ministry of Energy in which they will evaluate the positive and negative impacts of the, of the project and how they plan to mitigate this impact. Um, I'd like to point out that for us it was very important to make sure that the benefits of this reform trickle down to the local communities. And for this reason, we established in law guidelines to negotiate the, um, the payments for the land use and occupation. Um, basically, we want to make sure that uh, there is a fair, fair return for uh, the land owners uh, in these agreements. So even these are negotiations between uh, landowners and companies will be first done in sort of a, in between private parties, but if uh, the landowners or land tenants wish to have uh, the support of uh, government agencies, they will be able to do so. And in any event, if for instance you are acquiring, you know, companies acquiring the land, they would have to pay the commercial rate for this land, as well as uh, pay for uh, the land use, adverse effects, etc. When um, there is commercial production. A certain percentage of the income of the project could be negotiated as part of the benefits. And we establish in law a certain range that goes from 0.5 to more, no more than 3% for non-associated gas 
and from 0.5 to 2% for all the other cases. Um, I already mentioned that transparency and accountability is a key principle to our reform, and it's something that Mexican society has very, been uh, very keen on. Um, as I explained when I went through the scheme of how we will be awarding the contracts, uh, you could see that we have an institutional mechanism of checks and balances. Also, uh, we have a mechanism where we ensure that uh, the bidding rounds and the results are uh, conducted in public sessions. Uh, all the contracts and all the information related to the contracts uh, will, be made pub will be publicly available and we will establish a control system to effectively monitor cost recovery. In addition to that, as we strengthen our regulators, we also establish uh, specific uh, uh, um, guidelines for transparency and accountability. Some of them include that all sessions, agreements, and resolutions will be publicly available. And uh, since a couple of months ago, you can follow their sessions through internet. If you go to the page of either CNH or the CRE, you can follow them. Uh, the commissioners are not allowed to um, participate in cases where they have a conflict of interest. I mean, this sounds very obvious, but uh, what it is clearly established in law now is that if they do hear of an issue where they have a conflict of interest, this is a reason for them to be dismissed. Uh, also, two commissioners must be present at meetings between regulators and regulated parties, and a minute of the, of the meeting has to be uh, taken and made public. And in addition to that, there is a very strict ethics code that applies not only to the regulator, but to all the staff that works in their regulatory bodies, where it is prohibited to them to accept allowances, travel expenses, and gifts. With regard to the state-owned productive enterprises, uh, all corporate information will be published according to the Mexican Stock Market Act, disclosing their financial status uh, as well as that of their affiliates and subsidiaries. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to give the word to uh, Dr. Mesmacher. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just also very briefly uh, to thank Columbia University for the opportunity to be with you. I want to uh, thank all the specific uh, individuals. Lourdes already did so. So in the, uh, to try to do it a little bit more quickly, I will jump directly into the presentation. Uh, but before going into the slides, I would perhaps like to give you a very brief introduction for why the energy reform was crucial from the point of view of public finances. In the end, when you look at the Mexican economy and you look at the relevance of the energy sector, and in particular the oil sector, the truth is that the Mexican economy has diversified in a fantastic way during the last 30 years. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, oil exports actually represented 90% of Mexican exports. Nowadays, thanks to Mexico joining the GATT in the 80s, then the WTO, then NAFTA. And in general, a process of diversification in the Mexican economy. Uh, oil exports actually represent 13%, one three uh, percent of total Mexican exports. That's a completely different situation from the early 80s when actually oil exports represented close to 80% of Mexican exports. Today, Mexican exports, 80% is represented by manufacturing production. So there has been a very radical change from the point of view of the role that oil has been playing in the Mexican economy. There has been a very positive change from the point of view of much greater economic diversification, with the Mexican economy really becoming a manufacturing economy rather than an economy that just depends on natural resources. If you look at how much oil depends, oil represents as a percent of GDP, it's only 6% of GDP versus more than 20% just for manufacturing production and close to 30% for industrial production as a whole. If you look at how much oil employment represents in the total number of formal uh, workers in the economy, it's somewhat less than 1%. It's close to 0.6% 
of total formal employment. So the oil sector obviously is a large one, even a sector that represents 6% of GDP by itself is a significant and important one. But it's not like in the 80s where the Mexican economy and whatever was happening in the Mexican economy was driven to a very large extent by whatever happened to oil prices. One area, though, where it continues to matter a lot is from the point of view of public finances. Uh, government revenues, this number has been coming down over recent years, but when you look at total oil revenues to total government revenues in the public finances, oil still represents, total oil revenues still represent close to 30 percent of total public sector revenues. When you look only at the revenues received by the federal government, it still is close to 20 percent of total public sector revenues. So, where oil continues to play a disproportionate part uh, in the Mexican economy, it's as a source of public sector revenues. So whatever happens in the oil sector has very strong implications from the point of view of public finances, uh, public finances in Mexico. Now, what we had been seeing from the last, during the last 10 years is that after reaching a maximum level of oil production of close to 3.4 million uh, barrels per day in 2004, we had started to observe a very significant decline in the oil production platform in Mexico. Fortunately, during a very large part of that period, this very sharp decline in oil production, where actually production in Mexico has come down by close to 1 million barrels per day, that is a decline of close to 30 percent with respect to the peak that was reached in 2004. Fortunately, from the point of view of public finances, this time of declining oil production was matched by increases in the international price of oil. From 2004 to 2011, we actually observed a steady trend uh, of increases in international oil prices, which from the point of view of public finances and public sector revenues implied that the increases in oil prices more than made up for the decline in oil production so that we didn't actually observe a, any type of fiscal crisis or any type of fiscal problems. Unfortunately, in an environment where you actually have more stable prices, such as we observed from 2011 to 2013, or perhaps some declines in prices, as we have been observing during the last couple of months, obviously the situation becomes much more complicated. You start to observe scenarios where you continue to observe declines in oil production together with declines in oil prices, and that obviously poses a very significant challenge from the point of view of public finances in Mexico. Basically, I think we have responded in two ways. One is the approval of an important fiscal reform, which was approved at the end of 2013, and which has actually given us very good results and have allowed us to fully compensate for the additional decline in prices and in oil production that we observed in 2014 and that we will be observing in 2015. And then the second element of response uh, at least from the point of view of public finances, which is very important, is the energy reform itself. That is, making changes to the energy regime so that we can make sure that instead of having a declining oil production platform from the point of view of public finances, we actually observe increases in the oil production platform that actually lead to a stabilization of revenues in a context of stable prices or that actually allow us to compensate from the point of view of public finances for any additional decreases that we might be observing from the point of view of international prices. So in that sense, the energy reform for public finances in Mexico is very important uh, in the sense that an increase going forward in oil production is going to be a very important element to allow us to maintain a certain level of a government revenues in the Mexican economy going forward. Now turning to the presentation. Obviously, a, the energy reform implies very deep changes from the point of view of how we're going to be treating a, the oil sector. 
Here, what had actually been happening, and sometimes this is, this is something that is not well known, uh, obviously, uh, something that's also important in this discussion is the fact that investment by Pemex, uh, there have been a lot of criticism in the press because uh, of a very tight fiscal regime being faced by Pemex, and that is true. Pemex does face a very tight fiscal regime, but nevertheless, Pemex managed to triple its level of investment in exploration and production in the last 10 years from a level of close to $10 billion uh, per year in 2000, 2001, to something close to $30 billion per year currently, uh, which is comparable to the levels of investment that you observe in major multinational companies. Uh, nevertheless, in spite of this very sharp increase in investment, a production of oil continued to come down. And basically that has to do with the fact that the era of very large and easy to exploit reservoirs in Mexico, such as the mega field of Cantarel uh, in the sea outside Campeche, that era is more or less gone. And we're moving to an era of uh, smaller and more complicated fields with higher levels of risks. Uh, and in that respect, in spite of this very sharp increase in investment by Pemex, oil production has not stabilized. We need to have additional investment in the economy and in particular in the energy and oil sector in order to have a stabilization of production and eventually a recovery. So what this implies is that from a fiscal point of view, it made sense to actually allow for private sector investment in the development of the sector. Now, the fiscal regime of Pemex, as I mentioned, was a pretty tight one. Uh, in that respect, it actually captured a very large percentage of the revenues that Pemex had. That was not a regime that actually generated good incentives uh, for Pemex to be able to invest and to actually produce going forward. It didn't matter very much that Pemex's fiscal regime was too tight because in a sense it behaved almost like a central economy where you actually have a general director that's a government appointee and which receives orders uh, or which has instructions about what uh, he or she has to do. So in that respect, the fact that the incentives were not fully aligned from the point of view of the fiscal regime and uh, adequate exploration and production didn't matter much because in the end, it really was a company that actually operated uh, in sort of a very centralized and mandated way. In that sense, it was not a company that was looking for returns or adequate returns on the investment. It really was a company for obtaining rents for the government. Obviously, the fiscal regime has to completely change from this sort of command and control approach with which Pemex was managed if you actually want to have private sector investment. And in that respect, there has been, as part of the reform, a full revamping of the fiscal regime that is applying to the sector. It's very important to note that this new fiscal regime will be applying to any type of companies that participate through the new contracts, but it will also be applying to Pemex as well. The logic and the reform has Pemex changing in a very dramatic way. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to have Pemex actually work uh, in order to generate value. And in that respect, what the reform has is a fiscal regime that qualitatively will be the same for Pemex as it will be for new private entrants, trying to promote better incentives in Pemex as well. Uh, so that's a pretty relevant change. Now, uh, getting and describing the new fiscal regime, and this is very clearly a major change with respect to what was applying to Pemex before, in the sense that what we have tried to do is establish a regime that provides incentives for investment while nevertheless making sure that uh, the largest part of the economic rent continues to accrue to the Mexican government. Really here the idea is that companies receive a normal rate of return adjusted for risk and all the extraordinary return continues to accrue to the Mexican state. So basically what you know is that we have established three different types of contracts, uh, as three different new types of contracts associated with the energy reform. We have production sharing contracts, profit sharing contracts, 
and licensed contracts. Most of the fiscal elements are similar across the three different types of contracts, and I'll be going uh, over each one and perhaps emphasizing where the differences are going to be. The first fiscal element, and that is going to be applying to the oil sector as it applies to all the rest of the Mexican economy and firms that operate in the Mexican economy, is just the regular uh, corporate income tax. Uh, so obviously, that is going to be an element that uh, is going to be applying to all the companies that participate in the oil sector. Just to give you a sense of the, of the departure that we're having before, Pemex before didn't pay the corporate income tax. Actually, it paid the corporate income tax in the form of a royalty, which obviously implied inefficiency problems because royalties don't recognize the fact that for production, you actually have to incur costs and therefore you were not looking at profits, but rather gross revenue. So an important element is that corporate income tax will be applying to all the companies that participate in the sector. Then there is going to be a surface rent that is a payment, a relatively small payment for the Mexican government associated with the area that will be in each contract under, a, under exploration. Here the basic idea of charging an amount uh, associated with the area in the contract before production is to provide some type of incentive for the companies to try to push their production relatively early uh, and to try to avoid cases where you could have a company that just keeps a very large area without actually doing anything in it. Well, nevertheless, if they actually decide to do that, nevertheless, they will be paying us this surface rent. There were established also state and municipal taxes. We think that this is very important that local communities, as Lourdes mentioned, that local communities actually perceive the benefits of seeing a contract being developed in the community. This will include some payment for the people who are actually owners of the land where the companies will be operating, but we think it's also important for the community as a whole to benefit and perceive some of the benefits from having these contracts being developed in, a, in those areas. So in that respect, we established also a set of state and municipal taxes which are linked to the areas under contract development that will be in each state and in each municipality. The fourth element is a basic royalty, and that basic royalty will be applying to all the different contracts. It's a royalty that uh, actually has a progressive formula, so actually the royalty will be becoming larger for higher levels of oil prices or gas prices. Uh, and basically, the idea of the royalty is that that guarantees that the Mexican government will be receiving at least a minimum amount of tax payments once you have the first barrel of oil being produced. No matter what the costs are of the company, this ensures that the Mexican state will be receiving at least a minimum payment associated with uh, this level of the basic royalty. Uh, then we have the signature bonus. The idea of the signature bonus is basically, uh, in many countries actually, the signature bonuses are used sometimes as the allocation variable, so you actually have that contracts are allocated to the company that actually puts in the largest tender for the signature bonus. <coughs> the only problem that uh, we, we think we see with this type of approaches is that it sometimes leads to a lot of revenues accruing to the government at the very beginning of the contract, but then you tend to receive a smaller amount as the contract and production progresses over time. What we actually decided is that we actually wanted to be observing relatively high government revenues throughout the life of the contract instead of just having a large amount of revenues at the very beginning and then smaller revenues uh, going forward. So in that respect, we will be having some signature bonus, particularly in the case of licensed contracts, but the signature bonus will be a relatively moderate amount, uh, more like a statement of seriousness from the point of view of the contractor. And then we will be having the key elements to each one of the contracts. Uh, these are going to be the variables that will be entered in the bidding process. So in the case of production sharing, it's going to be the percent of 
oil uh, paid in kind, that will be received by the federal government. So what we will actually have in order to make sure that the government receives an adequate amount of the economic rent that is generated by oil activities is that we will have, as Lourdes mentioned, a competitive bidding process. And the idea is that the company that gets awarded the contract is going to be the company that actually offers the highest share of profit oil accruing to the Mexican uh, government. Uh, in the case of profit sharing contracts, it will be the company that uh, has the highest percentage of profits going to the Mexican government. And in the case of licensed contracts, it will be the company that is offering uh, to undertake the investment and the projects offering the highest additional royalty to the Mexican government. So in that respect, uh, what we're actually looking for is to make sure that the Mexican government continues to receive a, a large part and the largest part of a, any type of revenues that are received through these different variables and this bidding process, where through competition in the end, what we should be observing is that companies in the end will obviously be asking for an adequate return on their investment, but in reality, the extraordinary profit generated through rents in the oil sector will, to a very large extent, be flowing into the Mexican government. Obviously, as Lourdes mentioned, this uh, starts from the historical experience that in the end, in Mexico, oil beneath the surface is not private property, it's the property of the state. So in that sense, really, the rent associated with oil has to be accruing to the Mexican state. The different contracts will have uh, different opportunities for cost recovery. In the particular case of production sharing and profit sharing, there will be cost recovery, not in the case of licensed contracts. And then in a very important way, all of the contracts will be including an adjustment mechanism that will be trying to promote progressivity in the fiscal regime. That is, if eventually prices rise up back again and you observe a positive surprise from the point of view of prices, the idea is that the share that is received by the federal government actually goes up. Uh, this doesn't mean that the contractor won't be receiving anything. Obviously, the contractor will be receiving part of the benefits. But the idea is that if you have positive surprises, such as the price all suddenly going up much higher than what was expected, or if the actual uh, field uh, discovery is much larger than what was expected, then an important part of the positive surprise should be going to uh, the Mexican government. And in that respect, we actually have a progressive mechanism. The progressivity of the mechanism uh, will be applying both ways. Obviously, in a scenario such as uh, in a scenario where you actually end up observing lower oil prices than what was originally envisaged, the share might go down, but that provides some degree of stability in the contracts. But the idea is that whenever you have positive surprises, a large part of the positive surprise actually goes for the federal government. Uh, Lourdes already had mentioned the Mexican Petroleum Fund. Uh, I think it's worth emphasizing, given that this is really a new instrument uh, in Mexico, Mexico really had never saved a significant amount of the resources that were generated by oil in the historical period. And uh, so in that respect, I think that the Mexican Petroleum Fund is going to be carrying out three very important actions going forward. One has to do with the full financial management of the contracts. Uh, in the end, the Mexican Petroleum Fund is going to be a trust established at the Mexican Central Bank. It's not going to be at the Ministry of Finance. So this is a fund that is going to be established at the, at the, Mexican, uh, at the Mexican Central Bank. And here, the basic idea is that the fund is going to be the entity that manages all the financial flows associated with the contracts, the amount of resources that comes uh, and that ends up going for the Mexican government, also the cost payments that will be accruing to the contractors. And in a very important way, uh, with full transparency, 
the Mexican Petroleum Fund will be reporting on a contract by contract basis how many resources were coming from the contractor to the Mexican oil fund, how many payments of costs were going from the Mexican Petroleum Fund back to the contractor, and how much resources are being transferred to the Treasury to be used in the federal government budget. And this is something that is going to be reported contract by contract, month by month, in order to have full accountability and full transparency with respect to the use and the generation of the oil rent in Mexico. This is a new historical figure that was perhaps unthinkable before the energy reform took place, and it basically tries to guarantee full transparency and accountability associated with the management of these types of contracts. The third function that the Mexican Petroleum Fund will be following is one of long-term savings. Uh, and here, the basic idea is that when we have revenues accruing from oil above 4.7% of GDP, those additional resources will be saved in the Mexican Petroleum Fund to be used whenever the Mexican economy is facing some type of negative shock so it can have some degree of countercyclical fiscal policy or for savings for future generations going forward. So in that respect, this is really also a major institutional improvement from the point of view of public finances and of the management of the resources that the federal government receives from the oil sector. With that, I would finish this part of the discussion on financial variables and the financial relevance, and we would move to the last part with Juan Carlos Cepeda. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me start and continue here with the presentation. This is the map of the first round. Um, and let me start uh, making some comments on the labels in, your, in the top right of the graph. As you can see, the first bidding round in Mexico is not only about exploration blocks. That's the typical case uh, for the rest of the bidding rounds around the world. But given the fact that we are coming from a round zero in which we, uh, as, as government, we kept some fields uh, that were not awarded to Pemex, those, those fields will be part of the first bidding round and possibly uh, the, the, the rest of them for the second bidding round. But most of them are here in the first bidding round. So this is a, a, a particular characteristic of the Mexican uh, bidding round. We are. Um, we are including in this round not only exploration blocks, as it is usually the case, but also um, fields which are already discovered. That means fields that um, they, don't, they don't have any exploration risk anymore, since they are already uh, dis discovered fields, and as I will be showing to you, they have certified uh, reserves. Uh, apart from exploration blocks and fields, the first bidding round in Mexico also includes the farm mouths of Pemex. And this is important um, for me to clarify and stress this point because it's, there has been some confusion about uh, how, and, and, and how and when these farm mouths are going to be um, carried on. What Congress established is that farm mouths of Pemex have to be bid as part of the bidding rounds um, this is what is established by Congress. I mean, traditionally, um, what, you, what you see in the international experience is that the farm out is freely negotiate on a one-by-one -one basis by the NOC. This is uh, the, the particular case in which the Mexican reform uh, really departs from the international practice. Here, what Congress established is that the farm outs have to be beat and that they have to be uh, bid through the uh, regulatory agency. So the, the first bidding round in Mexico has exploration blocks, um, extraction, ex, uh, extraction fields, the fields with, uh, with the reserves, and the farm outs. All this map includes 169 blocks, 100 and, uh, 100 and nine exploration blocks and 60 fields, plus 10 farm mouths of Pemex. The last label are the current service contracts fields that under the law could be migrated 
to uh, exploration contracts, either production, license, or profit contracts. Those ones are not part of the first bidding round, but um, uh, I want to point them out and show where are in the map, and maybe you could have some questions regarding that migration. Those ones will not be bid since they are uh, since they were already bid in, in the first place as service contracts. Now the question is uh, that you will be, be having is how these areas were chosen. These areas were chosen on the basis basically of three factors. The first one is these areas are the most prospective areas uh, in terms of exploration and in terms of production, apart from the areas that were granted to Pemex in round zero. So the areas here, the exploration areas, were chosen in terms of their prospective resources. Prospective resources is the amount of oil or, and gas that we are expecting to extract from that area uh, on the basis of the probability uh, of success on the basis of the geological and commercial probability of success. So the areas that are here in, in, in round one are the most prospective areas in terms of the volumes and the probabilities of those different areas in the country. Now, um, that's the first condition, the first factor, prospectivity. Second element uh, that determine the selection of these blocks are um, infrastructure. All these areas, as you can see in this, uh, the south of, of the Gulf of Mexico, onshore, and also the areas in the Perdido Fall Belt area, are chosen on the basis also of the nearby infrastructure. All these areas are close to um, existing infrastructure for transportation. That, um, that was the second factor. And the third factor in order to pick these areas were the synergies with Pemex. All these areas are in the surroundings, are next to areas in which Pemex has exploration or development activity. Uh, synergies are important in two senses. First, transportation um, economics of scale, which is very important if you are considering, um, for instance, all the, all the blocks in the south in the south basins of the Gulf of Mexico, all those areas are close to infrastructure and transportation. The Perdido area, we don't have infrastructure there, but we have infrastructure crossing the border. Um, the pipelines coming to the Perdido Fall Belt area in the north part of the, U, uh, of the Gulf of Mexico, they have a spare capacity that could be used for the beginning of the development of the Perdido Fall Belt area on the Mexican side. Synergy in transportation and economics of scale is important, but also synergies in terms of learning, synergies in terms of information. As you start exploring an area, as you get more information from a block, you naturally reduce the uncertainty for the blocks nearby. So economics of information are also relevant in planning the development um, of the exploration and development of the fields in Mexico. Um, so this is the first bidding round. And all these areas, as I was mentioned, 169 uh, bringing together exploration and development fields plus 10 farmhouse of Pemex, they are arranged. We arrange all these areas in different packages in order to implement different, um, different biddings. Let me show you this one, and I will come to the resources in a minute. The bidding rounds, as you can see in the column in the middle, where it says new areas and fields, those are the different packages that we are uh, planning to, to run for the first bidding round. So the first package, the first bidding will be shallow water. And then we will have two, uh, the four more packages, one extra heavy oil, Chicontepec and unconventional resources, basically shale gas and shale oil. And the last one, um, then onshore, and the last one, deep water. So we have five packages. Uh, in these five packages, we arrange all these 169 uh, areas and blocks. And, they, and we will be running one bidding round for each of them. Now, for what about the farm outs? The farm outs of Pemex will be bid according to the type of field. 
So if Pemex requests a farm out, let's say, if Pemex requests a farm out in the Perdido fall belt area, like the ones at the very bottom of your slide, um, Pemex requested a farm out in Trion, Exploratus, which are in the Perdido fall belt area. Those farm outs are going to be bid together with the new blocks that we are presenting in the, in the bidding round for open participation. So in that sense, we are creating um, a sort of a cluster, regional clusters for investors to see the whole regional area in each case. So you as investors for every, every particular category, you will be looking at farm outs and new areas in which you could bid you could bid to be a partner of Pemex in the farm out, or you could bid, and or you could bid uh, in a new block and in a new area. Bringing these clusters and bringing the farm outs together with the new fields, uh, with the new fields and area, provides these economics of scale and synergies that we are expecting to have for every regional field. Um, so, and the timeline, the timeline for this is. By the end of this month, uh, we will be uh, releasing, we will be issuing the first, uh, the bidding guidelines for shallow water. The bidding guidelines will include um, the contract model, then you will be able to see the fiscal terms, the economic terms. That will start in November for shallow water by the end of this month. Um, the, the actual bidding for shallow water will happen until June. Before that, in January, we will open the data rooms. And then we will be moving one month off. We will be staggering the process for every package. The next month, December, we will release the bidding guidelines for extra heavy oil. And then in January for shale and Chicontepec. And we will be moving one month after the other in a staggering way so that all, the, all, all, all blocks and fields for all the first uh, bidding round should be awarded uh, towards the end of the next year. Now, in terms of the economics of this, um, sorry, I was trying to go back to this one. Now, in terms of the economics of the first bidding round, um, it is a comprehensive bidding round, as I said. Uh, we include all these different types of fields, 169 blocks plus 10 farm outs. How much is that in terms of uh, economic activity, in terms of investment? Um, as you can see here, uh, and I'm uh, pointing to the last column of the slide, the, the amount of investment that we're expecting if all these blocks and fields are awarded um, it round, it's approximated to $12.5 billion per year in the following uh, five years. That represents um, approximately 50% increase in the amount of investment in exploration and production in Mexico. Pemex more or less expends $25 billion in EMP every year. So this first bidding round will represent a 50% increase uh, in terms of prospective resources, um, it will mean bringing 12, uh, 14.6 billion barrels of uh, oil equivalent of prospective resources. And in terms of reserves, which, as I mentioned, usually you don't see reserves as part of a first bidding round, as part of any bidding round, uh, we will have uh, 5.4 billion barrels of reserves of oil to be certified as part of the first bidding round. So that's the broad picture of, um, of the bidding round, and with that, I think we should be able to open for, uh, for questions and answers. First of all, um, let's give the Mexican team another hand for that presentation. It was a phenomenal presentation. <laughs> Really just uh, an incredible ability to take us across a range of issues from the institutional, the political, the technical, and the financial. And thank you very much. And what we really want to do is explore that as much as possible and make people aware and sensitive to the extent of possibility and promise that is in the Mexican reform right now. 
Um, one of the things I wanted to tell everybody is that in addition to the people who are here, and thank you for all of you who came on a rainy day um, when many others were dissuaded, there are 200 people who are um, watching online um, at this very moment. Um, so there's uh, a, a, an extended audience as well. And for those who are watching online, they can ask questions via Twitter um, at Columbia U Energy, hashtag CGEP events. So we hope we get additional questions from them as well. Um, so um, first of all, just a, a little bit on myself. My name is Carlos Pascual. As Jason mentioned, I previously ran the um, Bureau of Energy Resources at the State Department and had an opportunity to meet many of uh, our colleagues here at the, um, in front of you uh, in both that capacity and when I was uh, the American ambassador in, in Mexico previous to that. Um, just a couple of comments or observations, and I, I think we first have to just congratulate Mexico for what it has done given the significance of energy and hydrocarbons within Mexico, the sensitivity of these issues, the fact that since 1938, the issue of private investment in hydrocarbons was never able to be touched. And now that you can open up this entire sector to private investment is a historical landmark moment. And that you were able to achieve consensus on moving this forward is, of, uh, is a phenomenal political record. But it's also a phenomenal political significance. Because having done that, now the payoff is in making the implementation work. And so if people ask, what's the balance between getting legislation done and now actually implementing it, the payoffs are in the implementation. And I think that that's something that has to be remembered. I think the second issue is to recognize that there is a, a promise of productivity that is coming with the implementation of these reforms. Um, uh, Miguel Mismacher uh, outlined earlier the, the collapse in production that occurred from 3.4 million barrels a day to 2.35 million barrels a day today. In the budget, you have a projection of 2.85 million barrels a day by the year 2018 um, as a productive output. Um, uh, Juan Carlos Cepeda outlined the implications for investment, looking at $12.5 billion in investment in 2015, $50 billion over that period of 2015 to 2018. And so there is this huge promise, but there's also a huge expectation and political expectation. And so indeed, one of the things that we'll want to discuss with this team is how to manage that and keep that forward, because I know that's been one of your big challenges as you've been proceeding. The institutional challenges are huge, and I, I wonder if, in fact, um, somebody could put up the slide on the timeline that Juan Carlos Cepeda was, um, was explaining earlier. The magnitude of this is absolutely huge. It's stunning in its ambition. You know, when I, I've worked on economic reform programs all, all over the world. Um, Maybe Ms. Makid, when you were with the IMF, I'm sure you had this experience as well, right? You go into a country, you talk about a reform program, and for the next five years, you're in this process of dragging everybody onto the reform process. So here we've got the opposite situation, where Mexico has not only announced reform, you're flying. You know, you're, you're taking off in a rocket ship here and, and going at an incredible speed. And so one of the things I think that'll be interesting for everybody, and um, Ludus Medgad, I, I think your, your insights here will be especially important, will be how are you managing this given the complexity um, of the situation that you face? I just want to underscore um, the number of times the word transparency was used. Because I, I think one of the things that's impressive about the team and going into the reform process is the sensitivity that it's had about the importance of maintaining a transparent process. And you've done that in the contracting procedures, but even on what you bid on, because in the end, the choice is going to be made on the government take that's actually proposed, as Miguel Mismacher had indicated. And that creates a certain degree of transparency on who wins and who doesn't win. And so understanding that is important. Final observation that I will make, and I'll use this uh, 
as the beginning of, of a question, um, and um, I'll start with uh, Subsecretario Ms. Market. Um, but of course, being in New York, you, you have to start with this issue of competitiveness in financial markets. Um, the one bad news issue for Mexico in doing this is that you're doing it at a, price at, at a time when the price of Brent crude oil has gone to $80 a barrel. And so one of the questions which everyone is asking is, how competitive are Mexico's fields going to be with other international opportunities, including, international op in, including opportunities here in the United States? Um, in discussions that we've been having with private equity firms, with banks over the past weeks, the first question that keeps coming up is, what's the break-even price for production? How much additional capital could potentially go in to support the levels of investment? And where do you get us to a situation where that competitiveness starts to be challenged? And, and so I think, it, it, you know, given the New York world of finance, if we can start on that question, and um, Miguel, if you can um, begin to lay out for us, as you've begun to analyze the potential of these fields, the competitiveness, and how they play into the financial world and financial incentives for investment, what kinds of things can you help us, can you, can you tell us that can help us understand how competitive these fields are going to be? Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Carlos. I think that one very big advantage that Mexico has in the, current in the current environment is that Mexico's oil sector was basically closed to foreigners for a, a very long period of time. So in that respect, what that implies is that you actually have a lot of a conventional and semi-conventional opportunities which have already been exploited or used in many other areas of the world, but which had not been actually used in Mexico. I mean, in a sense, you have, uh, at least at the initial stages, a large amount of, let's call them low-hanging fruit from the point of view of fields which may be very attractive, which have relatively low costs, and were actually interested in a world of relatively lower oil prices could actually be higher for these relatively low cost of production opportunities. So in that respect, uh, our impression is that there are a lot of uh, relatively good fields out there that will be uh, going into the tender program. And in that respect, there should continue to be a significant amount of interest associated with these opportunities. Now, one additional element, as I mentioned, is the fact that we decided to move from a fiscal regime which was extremely rigid and which applied to Pemex, now to a more flexible regime where you actually recognize that there has to be a positive return on the investments. And in that respect, obviously, what is going to be playing a very important role is the bidding process itself. I mean, in the end, having a bidding process, the fiscal conditions are not predetermined, but you will actually have the fiscal conditions through these three different variables, the share of production going to the government or the share of profits or the additional royalty going to the government. We actually will be having flexibility there, and in the end, the idea is that a contractors or people that are interested in investing will be offering us the best opportunities that seem reasonable given the level of prices that we're observing. And in that respect, having this bidding process will actually be making sure that the allocations are actually competitive. Thank you. I see so you pulling out your charts. Do you want to add? Well, yes. i just like to add to, to, to Miguel's comments. I mean, as he was mentioning, we are talking about the opening of a region one of the most prospective regions in the world, the Gulf of Mexico, in terms of oil and gas, is being open. And it was closed for almost eight decades. Uh, and let me give you just a couple of numbers here. I mean, the first bidding, the one that will be announced by the end of this month, um, the shallow waters, it is light oil. It is shallow um, 40 meters of depth, I mean, very shallow. The, the blocks that we are including in shallow water um, 
are above 700 millions of barrels of oil equivalent of prospective resources of shallow, uh, in shallow fields, light oil. Now, together with that, as I was mentioning, in this first bidding, we are including um, 32, uh, we have different number of fields. In the first package, uh, we will be including um, 12 or so um, fields in the first bidding, in the first bidding. But these, these fields all, uh, that had already discovered, we are talking about certified, international certified reserves of um, more than one billion barrels of certified 2P reserves that will be part of the, of the first, of the first uh, biddings in Mexico. I mean, there is no other place in the world that can offer in shallow water, light oil, this amount of prospective resources and this amount of reserves internationally certified. I mean, the opening, being the first coming into Mexico in this first bidding round, uh, honestly, from the geological, from the technical perspective, there is no competition around the world for this first bidding round in Mexico. Um, so, I, I, I think that's a, it's a compelling answer, and I, I think one of the things that's important to stress is a combination of the conventional resource, the degree of the resource that's being offered, and I'm sure that one of the things that investors and energy companies are going to be doing is taking out their seismic maps on the U.S. side of the Gulf of Mexico and looking at 40 meters of depth, light oil, what's been available, um, what the cost structures have been, and, and I, I think that's one of the exercises that everyone's going to go through. I think another piece of the exercise that everyone's trying to understand, uh, Miguel, if I can come back to you, um, you took us uh, uh, patiently through the, the structure um, uh, the, of the fiscal terms. And in, in a sense, there, there are three blocks of issues. Right? There, there are taxes that are on profit, there are royalties, and there's profit oil. And one of the questions that I, I've heard in the financial community a number of times is, um, it, it should be defined in law, but can you give us a sense of, for the, the percentage of taxes, the corporate income tax, the state, and, um, and the tax for states and municipalities and so forth, those things that are fixed in law, what kind of tax rate are, are bidders looking at? Uh, thanks, uh, Carlos. From the point of view of what's already fixed in law, I mean, one has to remember that probably th that in the end the most important fiscal component is going to be determined in the bidding. So in principle that will be coming out from, from the market. Now, nevertheless, looking at the other components, uh, in the end what you have from the corporate income tax in Mexico is 30 percent, very similar to what you have uh, very similar to what you have in the U.S. with a very similar structure. Uh, then the surface rent and the tax uh, that goes to states and municipalities is very similar to what you tend to observe on superficial rents in the U.S. as well. It varies by type of, uh, by type of area and it will vary depending on whether you are in exploration or in production. Uh, but basically, they are also set in very competitive terms, and it's a fee, uh, and it's a fixed amount uh, in pesos in both cases. It doesn't depend. Uh, it doesn't depend on the level of production, so it's not like it's an additional percentage. It's a fixed amount in pesos, and then the royalty, uh, which is determined by law, the basic royalty, that will depend on the level of prices, both for natural gas, for condensates, and for oil. Uh, for oil, we're typically discussing at current prices something along the lines of 10% uh, from the point of view of gross revenues. And then on top of that, you will typically observe uh, what basically comes out from, uh, from the auction. Uh, when you look at it in comparative terms, I mean, basically a 30% for the corporate income tax is perfectly competitive <coughs> with what you observe in the U.S., and then a level of the royalty, of the basic royalty uh, at current levels of prices uh, of close to 10 percent, uh, 10 percentage points, slightly larger than that, but, but along that range it depends exactly on the
precise level of prices that you have is also fully competitive. And all of that will be clearly laid out and specified in the pre-qualification criteria when those are laid out on a month-by-month -month basis, so in November, December, yes, etc. In the bidding guidelines. Right, in the bidding guidelines. Um, so, uh, Juan Carlos, can you just um, just take a second and actually um, uh, differentiate the between the bidding guidelines and the pre-qualification criteria and how they relate to one another? Well, yes, the bidding guidelines um, describe the process, the whole process, and it will describe that as a first, uh, it will describe the pre-qualification process, the bidding itself, it will talk about how to register and access the data room. The bidding guidelines will describe the whole process, and part of that is the technical pre-qualification, which includes showing your credentials, your experience that, uh, the, uh, your experience that you have the, the, the technical capabilities to develop and explore, for instance, in the first case, shallow um, water fields, and then you also have to show financial strength. Um, so the pre-qualification is the first element, then comes the bidding, but the bidding guidelines describe the whole process, as well as how to access the data room itself. Right. So if we just take this example, the first example on shallow water, the, that those bidding guidelines will come out later this month. Yes. And for shallow water. For shallow water. And the actual um, tenders will be issued in January at the point in time that the data rooms are opened? No. In November, the bidding guidelines. In the bidding guidelines, we'll describe the whole process, the whole time out. There, the, the, the second column in that slide, what it is showing is the opening of the data room. Okay. Um, but the process will work like this. In November, we issue the bidding guidelines. Um, January, we open the data room. Uh, companies will be able to register uh, before that, so that in January, right away, 15th of January, they could go into the data room. Um, then the pre-qualification will happen. Um, some, uh, we, are sp we are in the fine-tuning of the timeline, but it will happen between March and April. Then after the pre-qualification, we will open for a the Q&A process, companies would like to ask about all the, specific, uh, all the specific details of the contracts. So after pre-qualification, we will open for this Q&A, and this Q&A um, will run all, all the way up to one month before the actual bid day. So the Q&A will be closed one month before the bid day, um, which is the period in which we will be able to make any, any adjustment um, to, the, to the contract. And one month before the bid day, uh, the Q&A will be closed, the contract itself will be fixed, and then companies will have one month to go to their boards and determine uh, their strategy and, and the bid that they will be placing uh, on the bid day. Okay. Um, very useful uh, clarification. I'm glad I asked that, and uh, I'm very helpful to have that. Um, and one of the things I think it'll be useful for people to be clear about is once the pre-qualification is done, that completes the only technical review. There is no further technical review. The bids are decided simply on who offers the government the best take. That's correct. All the technical review is done in the pre-qualification. After that, as it is established in the law, the awarding criteria is only an economic variable as described by, by Miguel. It will be just the fiscal variable. In the case of the production sharing contract, it will be the profit share of the government. Okay, very good. So I have to ask you one other question on uh, competitiveness and price, which of course you have to get um, in the United States because um, whenever anybody talks about energy in the United States, everybody talks about the Keystone XL pipeline, right? Um, so if, if Keystone um, does get approved, what impact does it have on Mexico? You're asking to Miguel, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, uh, what you have been observing is a very sharp increase in production in the U.S. and in Canada, I think irrespectively of whatever uh, of whether Keystone has been, uh, 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 and this has been previous to the authorization of Keystone. Obviously, if the Keystone pipeline ends up being approved, that would imply that you would have potentially additional 
supply going into the market. But then again, it will depend on the balance that you have between supply and demand. Uh, if we actually observe, I think, a recovery in the U.S. economy, as has been expected, my impression is that you can still maintain a level of prices similar to the kind of level, uh, to the level of prices that we have been observing uh, recently. So in that respect, I think that one should not perhaps focus only on one particular project, but perhaps one should look at what seems to be the balance of demand and of supply overall. And very importantly, it will also depend to a very large extent on what OPEC decides to do, uh, on what OPEC decides to do this coming November and the forthcoming year. So in that respect, uh, I wouldn't necessarily venture to make a specific forecast about the implications that Keystone would have on oil prices and on opportunities in Mexico. My guess is that will depend on whatever is happening to global growth at the time and whatever have been the decisions or the reaction of OPEC to this additional, to this additional production. Obviously, if growth remains weak and if there is no reaction by, by OPEC, uh, probably one would expect some additional weakening. But uh, here, to some extent, it's going to depend to a very large degree on global conditions and on the response by oil producing countries. And here I'll just mention one thing that um, uh, might be useful to look at and, and for people in the audience will be interesting to look at is um, the environmental impact statement that was published by the State Department actually addresses this specific question. And one of the things that it addresses is what happens is if there is a significant increase of production from Latin America. And the results you'll be glad to know is that you displace oil from Africa and the Middle East. Um, anyway, that's not news. That was published in January. It's available to the public, um, and I invite you to look at it. Uh, let's come to the institutional questions um, a I minute. Just quick, quick comment before before that uh, uh, on, on on the Keystone project. Just I would like to to add to to what uh, Miguel mentioned is that. Um, Oil market is a global market. I mean, it's not like natural gas, right? So it is not a regional thing. A, in the case of oil, a transportation facility is not going to alter or modify uh, the balance of the demand and supply of, of oil in the market. I mean, the, the, the Keystone, it will, of course, provide an alternative, uh, an advantage in terms of transportation to North America, but it will not affect sensible uh, in, in any sensible way, the, the, the oil price in the market. I mean, it is a global market in, when it comes to oil. Well, I, I would just add that regarding Keystone, it does pose a certain challenge to Mexico, and I would take a, a different look at it. And it has to do with the fact that we will have to see uh, whether or not it changes the market for Mexican crude. Uh, right now, Mexican crude has had a very good market here in the United States because of the refineries uh, can process heavy, crude, you know, the heavier crude oil that we produce in Mexico. Uh, the crude that will be coming down from Canada would indeed pose a certain a certain challenge, and we'll have to see uh, whether or not we enter in a competition. And in this regard, Mexico has had to look for other options for its crude, and we have a, a strategy to diversify our markets and export, not only start again exporting to Europe, but also export to Asia. And, look for um, and indeed, it, it, it is a competitive market, and we'll resist the temptation to go into a deep analysis of uh, the energy market overall and what's going to happen in prices in the future. Um, uh, but it, it is interesting to, to note that um, based on some of the analysis that have been done, the indications are that Mexican production can be quite competitive with other suppliers um, coming from throughout the world. And I, I would just underscore as well the flexibility of the conditions that Miguel Mismarket um, underscored because it gives the bidders an opportunity to fit into the overall fiscal scheme in a way that makes sense to them and, and, and allows them to make a profit. Um, if we can put the timeline back up again, and um, Ludis, um, we, we, uh, I first met uh, Ludis Medgar when she was the Under Secretary of Energy in charge of the power sector. And there she had played a, a wonderful role 
in addressing Mexico's challenges in power modernization. Now one of the processes that she has to do is manage the coordination across all of the agencies that were in the chart that you showed us before. Um, and, and indeed, it's new because so much of all of this was in Pemex, that capability. There are capacities that have to be transferred out to um, the Secretaria de Energia. There are capacities that have to be transferred to CNH. There's a new role that um, Hacienda is playing on fiscal terms, and then all of the regulatory bodies that are involved. So how are you managing this and putting it together to, to, to allow it to make sense? Uh, well, first I would say that indeed it is a, a major challenge in the sense that everybody has to learn what their new role is. And in this regard, we have to do what uh, is clearly established in the law now. So it was, you know, it was easier when we were sort of drafting, uh, drafting the law and putting in words the model that we were planning. Now we're precisely in the process of uh, making sure that everybody gets to do what they have to do and getting certain activities that, for instance, we were doing some regulatory activities in Senair that now have to go to either CNH or to the GRE. We were overseeing, for instance, industrial safety. Now we have to put that at, uh, at uh, the uh, newly created agency for uh, industrial safety and environmental protection. Uh, so we are in this process of getting everybody to do what the new scheme requires them to do. And of course, this, this entails a lot of coordination and a lot of uh, working together as a team. And I think part of the reason why we've been so successful in moving forward in the, in the defi definition of this reform and then in the implementation thus far is the fact that we've been able to all work together as a team. Uh, part of it is derived from the fact that we had already had a few fail exercises, uh, one in the opening of the natural gas uh, market in the 90s, the other one with the energy reform, uh, the oil reform of 2008, and also with some of the uh, uh, exercises that we had tried, attempted in the power sector. So that, uh, that means that there is a group of people who are currently in government who have been attempting at doing this in the past, and we've learned from the failure lessons of the past one of them being the lack of coordination. So we are all moving together, and I think that's part of what has helped us uh, to be uh, flexible, to have a, a good attitude towards this, and to work as a team. Are your teams big enough, and what kind of external advice are you getting? And I, I, I shouldn't ask you if your teams are big enough because I know you don't get any sleep. <laughs> and I know that, you know, when I try to call one of you, you know, it's yeah, the two of the three of you are running around the world constantly. So I, I know there's a challenge, but um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing to be able to actually have the physical capacity to manage this. Sure. I mean, I think, um, first of all, we, we are indeed a s small team but we are a small uh, qualified team of uh, committed uh, civil servants who really want to move forward with implementation of this reform. And for instance, in the case of the Energy Regulatory Commission, which is in charge of overseeing the uh, mid and downstream of the hydrocarbon sector as well as the electricity sector, this agency has been in place for 20 years now. And of course, now it needs to be strengthened. It needs to have, it, it, it actually already has two additional commissioners. It's not just a matter of having a couple of more commissioners. It needs more knowledgeable people. And we've been very careful in selecting uh, people who have the experience and the capabilities. The same with CNH. Uh, CNH has been around for uh, five years now. Five years. Five years. It's, uh, all, it's not quite a newly born. It's, you know, it's a, uh, a growing kid, but it's getting all, it's getting strengthened. When we compare ourselves to other countries that have done a similar reform, many of them start without a regulator or start with a very small regulator. So here, here at least we have something to start working from. In addition to that, 
we uh, have gained we have gained a lot from learning from uh, international best practices. It is indeed one of the areas in which we're benefiting from being pretty much the last one. There is a lot of literature. There's a lot of experience that we can learn from people we can talk to. Uh, we have uh, hired some advisors who have been through similar processes such as this one. And, uh, you know, and we have had uh, some uh, very uh, um, consultants who are very specialized in certain areas who are helping us through this uh, implementation phase. Juan Carlos, uh, Miguel, do you want to add anything to that? Um, well, no, um, uh, as Lourdes was, uh, was saying, um, we have an advantage of uh, being being uh, in place for for five years. Um, maybe I would just like to stress: yes, we are moving fast, but this is this is uh, possible because we have been there before. Um, the the commission the commission is is reaching in the in the in the coming in the coming uh, months it will be reaching a standard level of um, nearly three three hundred. Uh, technicians working in there, which is a standard figure for international standards comparing with another agencies. But yeah, we also have some different external consultants working with us. Uh, and yes, that is making possible to move fast. I know there's a lot of interest in the audience and there are lots of questions that are coming in from Twitter. Um, somebody standing there um, has the first question. If you could introduce yourself and um, Hi, my name is Francisco Noyola. I first time. Sorry, we, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? No, okay. My, my name is Francisco Noyola. I'm with Williams. I want to congratulate you guys for the presentation. Uh, my question is with regards to local content. There's been a lot of questions about that. Is the local content threshold, when we say 25%, is that based on total contract value? How is that calculation going to be made? Is it going to be on goods and services that are going to be available in Mexico? And then as a follow-up, what happens when the local market is not competitive with the international? How would that be addressed? Okay. Uh, good question. Local content. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, let me uh, just first of all mention that uh, local, co local content requirement is something that is only seen in uh, the EMP contracts. In the rest of uh, the energy sector where we have a full opening, there is no such a requirement. But in each contract, we will be establishing what the local content requirement is, and this will vary depending on the type of field where, where we're working. And also the evaluation will take into account uh, what is uh, uh, feasible. For instance, in law, we established that at this point we are not requesting a local content requirement uh, in uh, deep water. And the um, Ministry of Economy will be working with us to determine how we can start establishing a percentage for deep water and start growing it over time. The average that we have in law is an average of all the contracts. And the idea is to go from 25% to 35% in 2025. So 25% 2015 to 35% 2025. And um, the methodology that was just published last week uh, includes uh, goods and services, technology transfer, um, uh, capacity building as some of the factors that will be uh, used to um, to calculate local content in the formula. Um, what are you seeing in the capabilities and the interest of Mexican firms to line up as partners in the bidding process? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? What are you seeing um, on the part of Mexican companies oh. um, lining up to participate in the bidding process as partners? Yeah, the, uh, indeed, we're seeing a lot of interest from, from Mexican companies. Um, of course, as you can imagine, the oil sector having been closed for such a long time, there's only really one Mexican oil company in Mexico, which is uh, Pemex. There are some Mexican companies that have been working abroad, in particular in the United States, uh, for instance, doing uh, shale development. And they are very interested in coming back to Mexico and doing joint ventures with 
particularly with operators, to be able to start becoming uh, local oil companies. Also, we are seeing contractors uh, of Pemex who are interested in doing the leap and becoming oil companies. And in that regard, they're trying to uh, establish the alliances to have the capabilities, uh, you know, operational, technical, and of course financial, which in many cases it's what they're mostly lacking in, at this stage. And what we're seeing in terms of possibilities for Mexican companies, of course, is in the areas where we think they will be more able to qualify. It would be probably onshore, probably mature fields. Uh, it's very unlikely that we will see a Mexican company with the exception of Pemex, for instance, in deep waters. Okay. Um, let's turn over to this side. Um, my name is Luisa Palacios. I work at Medley Global Advisors. I have three very specific questions. Um, the first one is, am I correct to believe that the farm outs are farm outs into production sharing agreements or profit sharing agreements, or it could also be licenses? The second is, is there any adjustment that you have made from the fact that you're having this bidding process in the middle of a very significant decline in oil prices? Sorry, I, 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 I couldn't hard understand to hear the you. second question. I'm <laughs> oh, sorry. Could you repeat that? The first is about the farm outs. Um, Am I correct to believe that the farm outs are uh, into production sharing agreements or profit sharing agreements or licenses are also part of what needs to be decided? The second question is about if you're making any kind of provisions or changes to the fact, to adjusting to the fact that you're conducting these bidings in a significant, with a significant change in oil price environment. And the third is if there's any fiscal stability regime that is being proposed. I mean, you do have a lot of this already in the law, but the corporate tax could change or could vary. Is that um, included in the contracts? Thank you. So um, first, uh, let's start with the farm outs and the type of contract. Uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll answer the three questions, uh, and then if Lourdes and, and Juan Carlos want to, want to elaborate on any of them. From the point of view of the type of contracts, uh, the type of contracts that we will be establishing will not depend on whether it's a farm out by Pemex or not. They will depend on the type of field. So for example, there will be a decision made that for shallow water fields, the type of contract should be, uh, to give an example, perhaps production sharing contracts. So all the production sharing contracts, irrespectively of whether they are a pure round one without participation by Pemex, or whether it's a format with Pemex, will have exactly the same type of structure. So the contracts are going to be geared towards the type of field, given that they have different types of economics, different types of risk, different types of costs. It's not going to be so much an issue of whether it's a joint venture with Pemex or it's actually something that is going to be auctioned separately. So the logic here has more to do with the underlying economics of the reservoir rather than whether this is something that will be taking place with Pemex participation or without it. So you might end up observing different types of contracts for different types of Pemex, uh, Pemex's formats. Uh, it really will depend more on the, on the structure rather than on the institutions that are involved in the, in the process. From the point of view of oil prices, our perception is that the regime, uh, particularly, for example, production sharing or profit sharing regimes, given that uh, those two particular regimes, they basically depend on the profits that are being observed they are very strongly resilient to uh, fluctuations in prices. Obviously, royalty regimes are perhaps a bit more sensitive to price changes, but nevertheless, given the economics that we have discussed, our impression is that nevertheless, they will continue to be, uh, to be competitive. So in that respect, obviously, what we have chosen is a regime that is sufficiently flexible. I think, and a bidding process that is sufficiently uh, flexible in the establishment of the final fiscal conditions, that this should be, uh, that this should be resistant to different types of, of shocks that are being observed. From the point of view of fiscal stability, 
Uh, we might end up including some clauses. You will be observing that uh, in, the final, in the final conditions uh, in the contracts. We haven't yet made any specific announcements, but obviously if we end up having any type of provisions in this respect, those will be included in the contracts. Let me turn over here on the side. Hi, uh, Thiago Cooper with Murphy Oil. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Juan Carlos uh, Cepeda. Uh, in regards to the data room, will companies be required to have a, a Mexican subsidiary or incorporate a Mexican entity in order to have access to the data room? Thank you. Um, all the process, all the pre the registration, the pre-qualification, and the bidding uh, itself could be done with a, with a company not necessarily incorporated in Mexico. Uh, what the law establishes is that before signing the contract, in case you um, are awarded a contract, then you need to incorporate and establish a company in Mexico. But previous to that, you could run all the process with a company, um, with a company abroad. And one question that comes in from Twitter related to that, in the data rooms themselves, um, what kind um, will the the data that has previously been in Pemex be migrated over, and will that be available? Will that seismic data be available? Will the well data be available? What what can bidders expect to see? Yes, uh, in, in the data rooms, um, what you should expect is the seismic information, all seismic information um, um, being shot by Pemex will be there, 3D seismic, 2D seismic, well logs, the correlations of these two, infrastructure, um, economics, the investments, and also um, in order to be sure that, the, that we are leveling the playing field, we are not only including the seismic and the information of the area per se, but we are also including the well logs and information of analogs of blocks that are nearby and are analogs to the to the one that is being uh, that is being um, uh, beat. So analog fields in Mexico. Analog fields in Mexico and uh, available information for analogs um, from the north of Mexico in the U.S. In the case of Perdido, but the analogs in Mexico is very important because you could think that Pemex, since Pemex has all the information for all the fields and blocks um, in the surrounding area, could have an advantage. And that's why we are bringing to the data room analogs of information of other blocks that are not necessarily the one that is being beat, but information of the nearby blocks uh, being held by PAMICS. Okay. Um, just up here in front. Good afternoon. My name is Nicole. And I would also want to congratulate the three of you for doing this. I believe Mexico really needs these kind of reforms, and it is one of the steps that it can take it forward. My first question is, how do you think the high levels of insecurity and violence in Mexico affect the incursion of possible international investors? The second question is, what happens to the oil union, the okay. ST? Sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to re The echo is really loud, and so oh, sure. I, it was, it's very hard Bo to both hear. Both of the questions? Yeah, could you repeat? Okay. The first one is, how do you think the high levels of insecurity and violence in Mexico affect the incursion of possible international investors. The second one is, what happens to the oil union, the Sindicato de Trabajadores Petroleros de la Unión Mexicana, run by the Shams after this is passed? Uh, I don't know if you guys heard that. Well, um, maybe yeah. I can start answering something and then my colleagues will add. I mean, um, as I was mentioning uh, during my presentation, one of the um, criteria used to, to choose the areas that are part of round one uh, were the areas in which we have infrastructure and areas in which we have activity of PEMEX. So the areas that we are presenting in the first bidding round is areas in which we are currently producing oil. It's areas in which uh, we are currently producing uh, 2.4 million barrels per day. So these areas are areas in which uh, current activity is taking place without, uh, without disruption. So that's one criteria that we use. Um, we didn't pick areas in any place or, uh, or areas in which there was a, an insecurity problem. The areas we're picking areas in which we have activity and we are currently producing um, oil and gas. I, I don't know if you would like to add something to that. 
Well, the, what I would add is uh, indeed that, as I mentioned, we, will, we conducted the social impact evaluation, which sort of gives us an X-ray of the situation in a given place. And another important part and fundamental to the reform is to make sure that we generate positive relationships with the community and that we trickle down the benefits of the projects. So not only are we initially selecting areas where we deem that the conditions are appropriate, but also as we start working, you know, doing the bidding processes and signing the contracts and having all these negotiations, we want to ensure that the community receives true benefits and that in that way we generate a positive cycle to make sure that the conditions are there for supporting these projects over the lifetime of the project. Um, let me just ask one final question from Twitter um, where there's a lot of interest in um, unconventional production and um, particularly shale formations um, on the other side of the Eagle Ford and Bokei. Okay. Is that part of phase three in Chacontepenque and, and conventional? What are the plans there? Yes, uh, 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 that's a good question. We are, uh, as part of round one, we have two shale, um, two shale regions that are part of round one. The first one and the most important one um, actually is not crossing the border with the U.S., but it's right in the center, um, close to the Gulf of Mexico in the state of Veracruz. There is there a basin uh, that we call Tampico Misantla. The shale formation in there is mainly oil. Um, according to the information provided by Pemex, um, in that area, the shale formation is 90% oil, 10% gas. So actually, most of the shale uh, blocks that we are uh, bringing to round one are mainly oil. But also, we are also including some, some um, blocks crossing the border with the U.S., which is gas and liquids. But the most attractive one is the ones we are presenting right now, mainly, which is in Veracruz. Uh, on, the, on the second part of the question, which we hadn't addressed yet, I think that what is, what is worth emphasizing is that the reform actually tries to change both Pemex and CFE in a very significant way. Obviously. The relationship that Pemex and CFE will have with their workers is something that will be determined by the general director or the institutions themselves. But what the reform has tried to do is to set a very different institutional framework to try to be conducive to higher efficiency and better performance in both institutions. What does that imply, for example? In the case of the corporate governance of corporate governance of Pemex, Pemex now has a new board where, for example, a, the union is no longer there given potential conflicts of interest, and you have actually looked to actually have independent members of the board a, of the corporate a, board of Pemex, which are fully independent. That was a problem that we had before. Uh, board members of Pemex before were actually full-time employees, and that obviously limited the type of people that would actually be available to perform in the board. So now, for example, in a very important way, you have fully independent members that are not government or Pemex employees. That will be bringing a sort of new dynamics into the board of, uh, of Pemex, the same thing with CFE, and corresponding with that, you have a set of very similar changes from the point of view of promoting, and this is again a, an issue that we've touched a lot upon, greater transparency, greater accountability from the point of view of the decisions, and uh, being a member of the board of both companies, uh, I can tell you that Qualitatively, you really feel a very significant change from the type of discussions that you have in the companies of both institutions. I mean, in, in both cases, you have now very respected academics, for example, as part of the companies. You have successful businessmen, which are in completely different uh, sectors of economic activity but which bring uh, the experience that they have of running a business, which is something that, uh, that bureaucrats that participated in the, board of, uh, in the board of both companies didn't know. So in that respect, I think that the institutional change that is taking place 
both in Pemex and in CFE uh, is very significant. It's not targeted to a particular change or against any particular a type of institution, basically what you're trying to do is to set up a completely new institutional framework that will lead to a better performance in both companies. Uh, and having been there before and being there now, uh, I can tell you that the board operates in a significantly different way, uh, and my impression is that uh, this is for the better. Great. Well, let me, uh, just by way of uh, wrapping up, I wish we could spend another two hours talking about this, and I know there's a lot of questions and many online as well, uh, but we're a couple minutes over, and so uh, just by way of wrap up, uh, I want to thank again the Mexican team for really an extraordinarily detailed uh, discussion and presentation. Uh, Ambassador Pascual for uh, moderating, and you can see uh, from his participation here why we're so honored and lucky that he joined us as a fellow here at the Energy Center. Um, I want to thank all the participants, but uh, I'll, I'll, a special thanks to Minister Melgar. There's been a little lot of Twitter activity about this, uh, this, this event tonight, and one caught my eye from Michelle Alvarez, who wrote, it's always extremely inspirational to see powerful women in top leadership roles. And that made me think of the Center on Global Energy Policies Women in Energy program that Ka Wei in the front row runs, where we bring top women in the energy field to Columbia to speak and also to interact with our students here. And that's been a huge success that's growing rapidly, and we hope early next year to announce a major expansion of that. So I just wanted to put a plug in for that. Um, this has been a great discussion. This is an incredibly important topic at the Energy Center. We're going to be doing a lot more work on uh, helping the public and policymakers understand what's happening with Mexico's energy reforms. Uh, particularly honored that Adrian Lejeu, the former CEO of Pemex, chair of the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, is also a fellow at the center who will be writing on that. Uh, already has one paper posted on the center's website about this topic, and we'll have more publications coming out soon. Uh, we'll be hosting lots more events on Mexican reform and many other trends happening around the world. The next one will look at what's happening everywhere in the world when Fatih Barol, the chief economist of the International Energy Agency, presents the new World Energy Outlook 2014 uh, in around lunchtime on November 25th. You can attend, obviously, in person. You can also follow all of our events on Twitter at Columbia U uh, Energy. Uh, all of our events are, uh, can be watched uh, live stream, and they're also available for download as a podcast through iTunes or on our website. And this event, uh, and also the slides from it, will be available on our website. Uh, and la lastly, there'll be a reception uh, just uh, when we wrap up, just behind this big curtain here. Uh, and everyone is welcome to come back there for a few minutes. So please join me again in thanking Ministers Melgar, Messmacher, and Zapata.